Welcome. Thank you for being here. So good to see all of you. I want to welcome our guests. Thank you for coming and being a part of the Cornerstone Church tonight. We're so glad to see all of you. And it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce you tonight to Brother Clay Gentry. I've known Clay for probably over a decade now. Uh, first met him right before we moved to Ohio, and uh, we've had the opportunity to to be together on several occasions and uh, to just to just be good preaching friends and uh, call and encourage one another. And so, finally getting to hear him preach in person tonight after over a decade. So excited for that. Clay works with the Jackson Heights Congregation in Columbia, Tennessee. Uh, he's been there for a number of years now. He's been married to his wife, Shelly, who is here with us. They've been married for 21 years tomorrow. Congratulations. Shelly is a reading specialist and interventionist at Columbia Academy. And she and Clay have four active children, Isaac, Lily, Micah, and Anna. In addition to his preaching work, Brother Clay is a rural mail carrier with the Columbia Post Office. The family enjoys seeing his historical sites, raising chickens, a good story, and an occasional nap. We're excited to have you, Clay. Thank you for being here with us. I'm going to step aside, and Jeremy Price is going to follow with a prayer. And after that, we'll ask our younger kids to be dismissed to their classes, and then Brother Gentry will lead us in the lesson. Thank you for being here tonight. Brother, Brother Price. Let's all bow together. Our Lord God Almighty, we are humbled as we approach you this evening, as we are gathered here to, to study your word and to encourage one another and to lift each other up. Lord, we are so thankful for the time to be together, just to take some time to put aside the world for just a moment. <clears throat> and to encourage each other's lives and open your words so that we may better understand you and, and your plans for us. To have a closer relationship with our brothers and sisters and to draw closer to you. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We thank you, Lord, for our brothers and sisters and what power there is in a relationship with you, Lord, and the strength we gain because of all that you do for us. It is such a wonderful blessing to know you and to be your child. And I pray as we, as we open your word this evening to discuss this topic of love and sex that we will uh, listen to Brother Gentry and take what he, what he brings from your word into our lives. And just pray that he may present a lesson from your word that we can build upon in our marriage relationships. The greatest relationship you set up for us in this world today is, is one with our spouse. And just pray that we are encouraged by this lesson. That we are reaching and striving for a relationship that is fruitful, not only for our physical needs, but for growth and for patience and, and understanding, for love and desire and communication, uh, for spiritual edification and encouragement, that we might support our spouse and seek to to meet their needs and to grow together, to reach heaven together and to bring others with us. I pray our own children may know the importance of marriage and what that represents and that we may present ourselves as, as an example to them. Please, Lord, bless our families, bless this church and, and be with us in our studies. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your son who died on the, that cruel cross so that we may have salvation. We continue, Lord, to fail you and to sin against you, and we just ask you, please, Lord, to forgive us. Please help us to be strong and to stand firm against Satan and to no longer give in to his temptations. It's such a blessing to have brothers and sisters to stand with and to fight this battle against Satan, and I pray our success in this battle so that we may reach that home in heaven to live forever in your care. Please, Lord, direct us this night. Be with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'm going to be turning in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. That will be our beginning text this evening. It's good to be here with you. I was asking Matt over supper this evening, what is it like, you know, being a southern boy and being up north? And he said, it's not really like being up north. There's a lot of Tennesseans there, Clay. You won't believe how many Tennesseans there are at the congregation. And so he started ticking off a few. And uh, I, knew, I knew Trish was here. She and I grew up in the same congregation together. And her father, Eugene, meant so much to me uh, in my form- formidable years. Uh, then he said... Um, uh, Madison Tracy, y'all might know her. She, she's, she's very special to someone here. And I said, oh yeah, I remember when, when she was a little baby running around the table at Cracker Barrel. Uh, Shelly and I, before we had kids, went out to eat with uh, Jim and Raina, her parents. And the kids are just running around the table. And I'm like, how on earth are they able to do this? And then we had four kids and they just run around the table. And I'm like, I get it. And uh, then he said, that there's somebody else there... <laughs> He goes, I think they were from Huntington. Huntington, he said, yeah. And I'm like, okay, I know people from Huntington. He said, Jeremy Price, and I dropped my fork. Jeremy's dad preached for us when I was uh, maybe 10 or 11, 9. And Jeremy and I spent uh, a lot of Sunday afternoons running through the woods together and playing in the yard. And I just thought to myself, Maybe not so much what a small world it is, but what a dear fellowship we have. We can go two states away and there are people that we know. And people who love us and who care for us. And it's a great blessing. And it's a great blessing to be here with you. We live in a sex-saturated society. It's a major component to the plot lines in TV shows, movies, and books. Sex is the topic of so many songs of every genre. Sexuality has become a political and a social movement with gay rights and pride campaigns. Sex through the medium of pornography dominates the internet. Sports are being upended by transgender issues, specifically men competing as women. Storybook hour at libraries have been hijacked by drag queens. And let's not forget the ubiquitous ED commercials on radio and TV. Needless to say, sex is everywhere. Yet despite all the attention and even the obsession that our society devotes to sex, human sexuality remains an uncomfortable topic of discussion among Christians. And consequently, it's to our detriment that we ignore the topic. For some, it may be well and good to not talk about such sensitive issues. But if we don't talk about them, then Satan will fill the void. If we do not give a framework of understanding God-given sexuality, then society will fill the void. We need to understand that when it comes to matters of sex and sexuality, the Bible is not prudish, and neither should we. What I'd like for us to do tonight is to answer several questions along the way. Questions about what is God-given sexuality? Questions about what exactly is love in the marriage relationship? And what role does sex play between the male and the female in the bond of marriage? For all of that though, we need to go back to the beginning. We need to go back to Genesis chapter 2. And look at what God says there, beginning at about verse 18. Now one of the problems that we have at times when we come to the 
creation account, as it's sometimes called, about the creation of the man and the woman in Genesis 2. Is that, is some people think that this is just a, an extra... Uh, an extra creation. I've heard people say that the woman was created later. That's not so. She was created on the sixth day. This is just added detail about why God created the woman. And in giving us this extra detail, we find out about something else that God created. He created sexuality. He created marriage. And so if we're to understand these topics, then we need to go back to the beginning. So let's begin reading at verse 18 of Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God said, It's not good for man that he should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heaven and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and he closed up its place with flesh. And from that rib, the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife that shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. The first thing that we learn in this particular section is that alone, Adam was not complete. It was not good for the man to be alone. And that really stands in kind of a stark contrast to everything else we read in the creation account. God does something, it's good. He does something else, it's good. And again and again, it's good, it's good, it's good. But then here, him being alone, it is not good. And so what God does then is he, he begins to parade all the animals before Adam. And maybe, maybe he is doing this in order to, to find someone or something that is a compliment to Adam. But I think that, that something else is going on. I think what God is doing is he is demonstrating to Adam nothing else in the creation that I have made is complimentary to you. And so he does something else. He fashions someone who, who is like Adam. That's why Adam will say in verse 23, At last, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is someone who is like me, but different from me. And so thus, in this story... Eve, the female, becomes an, the only complement to Adam, the male. We might even go so far as to say, and, and I think we'll develop this as we go through the lesson, she becomes the only sexual complement to Adam. We can go back into the more condensed version of the creation account in chapter 1. Look with me at verse 27. Uh, let's see... Um, so God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. He created them male and female because they are complements of each other. God blessed them. He said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven, over every living creature that moves on the earth. And God said, uh, He goes on to say, Behold, I've, I've given you every plant to eat. Uh, this shall be food for you. Uh, and every uh, beast of the earth shall be subdued by you. And when he does all this, verse 31, and God saw that everything he made, it was good. You see, together with the perfect complement, the male and the female are good. But then we get a little something at the end of this creation account of the male and the female. We get a little commentary. Moses, as the writer of Genesis, is giving us the historical account. 
until we get to verse 34. I'm sorry, verse 24. It's here in verse 24 that he breaks the historical narrative and he gives us some commentary and some application from everything that he has been saying. And so he says there, therefore, because these two are the perfect sexual complements to each other, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Let's expound on that for just a moment. There, there's at least two things that we need to point out. First of all, when he says a man shall leave his family, leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, what Moses is saying is that by forming this relationship with his wife, he is establishing a relationship that takes preeminence over and importance over any other relationship that one might experience in life. Now in biblical times, the norm was the wife left her father and mother and came to live with the man. You don't have to go very far in the book of Genesis to find just the classic example of this. You just flip over to the right a few chapters to chapter 24, and here's where the servant of Abraham goes out to find Isaac a wife. And he goes out and to bring her back. And in fact, the servant even says, or asks Abraham, what if she will not come back with me? But what Moses says here is that this is not about proximity. It is about relationships. It's not about the geography of where we happen to live. It's where is our heart. The marriage relationship above all other relationships is preeminent and is the most important. is more important than our relationship with our parents. I can't tell you as a preacher how many times I've had folks come to me, married couples come to me and say something along the lines of, her mama is interfering. <laughs> His daddy said this, your marriage relationship is more important than your relationship with your parents. And I'm about to break some people's hearts here, but it's also more important than your relationship with your children. I can't flip around in my Bible and find a Bible passage where it talks about my prayers being hindered because I may not be the best parent in the world, but I can show you one where it talks about your prayers will be hindered if you're not the best husband in the world. Jesus is talking about divorce in Matthew chapter 19. He says, what, man ha what God has joined together, what? Well, let's quote the King James here. That's how we all memorized it, right? Let not man put asunder. <laughs> I know of a lot of marriages that have not been ended by divorce, but they've been ended by not putting the marriage first. And if we want to be people, if we want to be people who stand out in society, I'll tell you one of the best ways that you can advertise this congregation, one of the best ways you can advertise the gospel, one of the best ways you can advertise being a Christian is have a strong, strong, strong marriage. And the first point that Moses makes after establishing the creation of human sexuality and the creation of marriage, and as we will see, the creation of sex, he says, you've got to put this relationship first. There's something else that we learn here. And he says that they became one flesh. 
I think this influences the very ideas that Paul sets forth about marriage in Ephesians 5. So let, let's go over to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 5. One of the places where we can go in the New Testament and find one of the richest descriptions of marriage. Listen to what Paul says beginning at verse 22. We'll, we'll set the whole context here. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water and the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, in the same way, husbands, love your wives as your own body. Nourish it. Cherish it, just as Christ does the church. As Moses is laying out for us what it means that God has created male and female and He's put them together, he first says that this is a primary relationship that we enter into as human beings. But he also goes a one step further and he says, and the two, two separate ones will come together as one flesh. And then as, he's, as Paul is laying out for us this idea of how sacred marriage is and how we're supposed to love and honor and cherish and respect each other, he says to us husbands, you do that because you are one with her. You love her like you love yourself. You cherish her like you would cherish yourself. You nourish her like you would nourish yourself. Because you are one. I know this passage is put into the masculine. And I, and I often wonder sometimes, you know, what, what, what should we do with, with gendered Bible verses? Should, should, should we leave them gendered like they are? Or are there times when it's applicable to both, even though one gender is used over the other? I think this is a great place where we can blur the lines just a little bit. Men, love your wife as yourself. Love your wife like Christ loves the church. Ladies, you are one flesh with your husband. He is not your extra child. Please don't treat him that way. Is that... Is, I can laugh a lot. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> he is not... I'm not even going to say it again. <laughs> He's not an extra child. I'll say it. Love him like yourself. And let's take another gendered passage. How about Titus chapter 2 and verse 4? There Paul is talking to the older women and he says to the older women, here's what you need to do. You need to, you need to teach the younger women to love their husbands. Yesterday was the 25th anniversary of our first date. And today is the 25th anniversary of our second date. Usually the way I tell it is, the 28th is the anniversary of our first date, the 29th is the anniversary of our second date, and the 30th is when we got married. And, and usually people are like, wow. It was, only, it was four years later. The kids have asked the question multiple times, how, Tell us the story about how you met. And, and so I love telling it. Shelly doesn't like me always to tell it, but I'll tell it. Because I'm not scared. And um, 
It was a hot June day in McEwen, Tennessee. I was at the Dairy Queen, because that's what we did in McEwen, right? We went to the Dairy Queen. And this girl walks in. And I said, that is the most beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. i got to go out with her. And so we did. And I get back to the Dairy Queen. And I <laughs> called her up on the phone. I said, do you want to go out tomorrow? She said, sure. So we go out for a second date. And as we're driving home, I said, I'm going to marry you whenever you get of age. And, and <laughs> I was almost 21, she was 16, so, you know, I had, to, I had to wait. It, re it really was love at first sight. I mean, no joke. I've been crazy for that woman from the first day. I, I bet if we went around the room, some of y'all could tell similar stories. But no matter how quickly we fell in love, there have been times in our marriage, and probably in your marriage too, where, where she had to learn to love me. And I had to learn to love her. And what is our motivation for wanting to love our spouse? We'll go back to our previous point. Because this is the most important relationship we will ever, ever engage in in this life. For those of you who are in the audience and you're married, think for a moment the vows that you took. And the words that you've said over the years, you're one, joined together. One. Love your spouse, nourish and cherish them in that relationship. And when you don't feel like loving them, maybe that's a good time to call up one of your elders or an older member. And say, tell me how to learn to love. Because this means so much. But not only that, I'm hitting the wrong button there. There we go. Male and female oneness in marriage is a reflection of the oneness of God. I, I, I had emailed Matt and uh, I said, hey, look over that manuscript. If there's, if there's one thing or two things that you think maybe I need to really in, emphasize, would you just let me know? And so he sent me back five, a five-point email and uh, he said, keep it under 50 minutes. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> This is something we need to emphasize. And if you have a copy of manuscript, I think I only actually did this in just two sentences. It might have been maybe just one sentence. We need to look at it while we're here. The language that is used to describe our God is language that is plural and singular. We often refer to this as the idea of the, the Trinity. We believe in a Trinitarian God, that He is three in one. Three separate spiritual beings, if you will, coming together as one. In fact, even in the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, he says, uh, let us, plural, make man in our image. Uh, in the image of God, he created them. A little bit later in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, that, that, that great summary statement about God where we're to love him, it begins with the idea that our God is one. In the, in the baptismal statement of Matthew chapter 28, is Jesus is given the Great Commission. He says, go and baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
If you don't understand all this, Matt will preach on it very soon, I know. And so, <laughs> getting that preaching schedule lined up for you. So, we often... There we go. We often put this in a in kind of a Trinitarian format. It, you're probably very familiar with this. Uh, Father and the Son and the... Can I ask a quick question? Y'all, wait just a minute. I've got to talk to Matt. Where do I point this thing at? Right there. Okay. <laughs> hey, even at Jackson Heights, I, uh, where I preach every Sunday, I still have this problem. There we go. <laughs> this one says spare. <laughs> all right, so, so we're all familiar with this, right? Everybody's seen the Trinitarian diagram, very familiar to you. Um, and there, there, there we go, there we go. Forget it. Uh, here we see that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and yet they all come together as one God. They are one. Well, it shouldn't surprise us then that if we did the exact same thing with our marriages. Someone gave us a poem. Shelly has it framed. It's on her dresser. It's entitled, It Takes Three. And it's a poem about how a good marriage takes three. It, it takes a man who loves his wife and a wife who loves her husband and two people who love their God. Well, the man is not God. The man is not the woman. The woman's not God. And yet, in marriage, they all come together, we all come together as one. I think this is a real challenge for us to understand the importance of our marriage and in the way that it represents God and His relationship with Himself and His relationship with the church, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5. Because how can people think that God loves them if His people who are called by His name don't love each other? And I ain't talking about brethren, I'm talking about husbands and wives. How can they think that God dispenses grace and mercy when a husband and a wife never dispense grace and mercy to each other? It's in our marriage that we are reflecting this oneness of God. Yes, we are the same because we are human. God is, uh, every component of God is spirit. And yet each one's different. And just as my wife and I are different, and you are different from your spouse. We come together as one. Here's the point, though, I'd like to make off of this. Is that homosexuality cannot can never reflect the oneness of God. If somebody was to come up to you and ask you, why do you believe homosexuality is a sin? I think most of us would say, because the Bible says it's a sin. And that's not, that's not the wrong answer, and that's not the bad answer. Because obviously you don't have to go very far from where we're at to Genesis chapter 18 and you, you have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, that, that great story about God's judgment against sinful homosexuality. Or you can go to Romans chapter 1, really where Paul, quite interestingly, lays out the course of history through a sexual lens. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, in Romans chapter 1, he's talking about the depravity of humanity. And he says, For this reason God gave them over to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with women and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And even as Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, he writes there about some of them who had been practicing homosexuality but had repented of that and become Christians. It doesn't matter what stage you are talking about in the Bible, homosexuality is condemned. And so it's not a wrong answer to say it's wrong because the Bible says it's wrong. But what I want to ask you is, why does God say it's wrong? On one hand, it's because it's never been that way. That's not how God created us. 
but also because it does not reflect the oneness of God. So let's take our idea again. How's this going to work? It can't. Obviously, a man or a female, you can put anything in here, uh, they are not God, and God is not them. But if we're wanting to reflect the oneness of God in our relationship, the circuit breakers tripped in this diagram. Because they cannot, in this scenario, two males cannot come together and reflect the oneness of God because they are the same. We had a clerk at the post office in Columbia. And I appreciate him very much for what he said. But one day on Facebook, he He said, I have been practicing homosexuality now for years. But I can no longer do that. Because God's not in it. God's not in my homosexual relationships. And he said, I'm going to leave that lifestyle behind. The reason that homosexuality is wrong is because it can never reflect the oneness of God. The oneness of God is reflected in similar but different beings coming together in a commitment of unity. Homosexuality can never do that. I know that we've have experienced a month in our country where this has been pushed to the forefront and into our faces. This afternoon, Shelly and I were just kind of driving around and admiring the architectural beauty of your city. Some of you laughed. It's really pretty. <laughs> I can't tell you how many pride flags I saw. It's, it's everywhere. While we may be as Christians turned off to that, while we may be as Christians angered by that, or disappointed that our culture and our society has come to that, we must remember, we must remember that we possess the door out of that sin. We possess the Gospel that can take anybody from that sinful lifestyle that cannot reflect the oneness of God and bring them to a place where there is forgiveness and where there's grace and where there is mercy, where there is transformation, where they can live, where we can live in proclaiming the glory of the oneness of our God. But you can't ever tell somebody, oh, over here there's grace and mercy and forgiveness if over here you're not showing them grace and love and mercy. And, and it's really hard for us to say, hey, over here is the biblical model for how we're supposed to be living if over here we're not doing it with our spouses now. Well, let's get to our last statement then that Moses gives us. The last statement that he makes, and we'll go back to Genesis chapter 2, he's given us the creation of the male and the female. He has informed us about how our relationships are to reflect the oneness of God and how we're supposed to love our spouse as our own self. Then he makes a statement there. And it's almost like verse 25 is thrown in as, a, as an afterthought. Oh, 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 hey, by the way. They were naked and not ashamed. 
I recognize that there's an idea here that this nakedness represents their sinlessness. It is because they sin that God gives them clothes. So I, I get that. But, but I, I want you to think about something else along this same lines with me. That this is an idea, because this is a marriage passage, that this is an idea that the two of them shared unabashed, un, uh, unadulterated love for their sexuality with each other. When it comes to the Bible teaching about marriage, more attention is devoted to sex in marriage than any other topic. Now, if you've ever been to a marriage seminar, if you've ever been to a marriage class or bought a marriage book, chapter one is almost always about communication. I have yet to write a book on marriage advice, but if I did, I think this would be the first chapter. Because in God's divine and inspired Word, when He talks about the marriage relationship, He spends more time talking about sex than any other marriage topic. Maybe it's because we have the most difficulty with it. We're talking about it ourselves. But we need to see that when he says they were naked and not ashamed, this unabashed nakedness speaks about God's view of sex. And he says over and over and over again, in this context, it is good. I want to discuss for just a moment, why why is it good? Why why do we need sex in marriage? Because it is a hedge against sexual temptation. Over in his epistle to the Corinthians, Paul's going to talk about principles that are governing our marriage in chapter 7. And and he does say at the beginning, now, It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. I I guess according to Paul, the best kind of guy is a single guy that can just travel the world preaching. I'm here today. I'm so glad to be here today. I'm really enjoying my time here. I really do have a hard time sometimes just leaving Columbia. I'm a homebody. (laughs) I could never have been a Paul. But notice what he does say in verse 2. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each wife her own husband. I have talked to guys in the past who have told me, who have come to me and said, Clay, look, I've, I've, I've got a problem with pornography in my life. It, 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 I feel like it's controlling me. I feel like it's consuming me. It's what I think about all the time. And in discussions with them, ladies, listen to me. When I discuss this with them, every time, every time, the man says, my wife will not have sex with me. Good, healthy, sexual relationship in the marriage is a hedge against the sexual temptations of this world. Sure, men, you have a responsibility to set a guard over your eyes and not go there. Ladies, you have a responsibility to give your man an outlet. And we also need to recognize that sex in marriage is normal. That might seem like an obvious statement, 
But I've preached seven sermons on this. And it without fail. Someone will come up to one uh, to Shelly and has said something to her. One old lady, older lady came up to me and said, Are you done yet? And I'm like, hold on, sister, I got two more lessons. And it would seem obvious to say sexual relations within marriage is normal, but I know people for them it is not a normal part of their marriage. And it should be. And in fact, as Paul is writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he not only says it's normal, he says it is to be expected. L- listen again to what he says. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights or her marriage rights. Likewise, the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but he belongs to the wife and should give to her. In the English Standard Version, the conjugal rights that are due her. Not only that, Not only is it normal, and not only is it expected, not only is this a a hedge against temptation, but in a biblical context, sexual relations within marriage is something to to be enjoyed and to be celebrated. Go back with me to the Proverbs real quick. What do we got up there? Proverbs 5. Look look with me at uh, about verse 15. He says, drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. He ain't talking about water. So everybody knows. Should your springs be scattered abroad and streams of waters in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely dear, a graceful doe. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated with her love. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds great. It should be something that that, that is enjoyed by the married couple. Something that that has such strong power over the other and over the couple themselves that that we could call it being intoxicated with it. Or or listen to what is said in Proverbs chapter 30 at the wonderment of, of love between a man and a woman. He says, these things are too wonderful for me, for I do not understand the way of an eagle in the sky, the way of the serpent on the rock, the way of a ship on the high seas, and the way of a man with his woman. That's Bible, folks. God's not prudish. God celebrates. And in fact, we have an entire book of the Bible that celebrates the joys of erotic love. Sometimes you'll see it called the Song of Solomon. Sometimes it's the Song of Songs. It's kind of depending on which translation you have. Maybe we've spoiled some of those phrases by incorporating them into our hymns, making them about Jesus and the church. And that's a typical explanation that you hear about it. I just don't buy that. I think these are love poems and these are marriage songs and they are all about the desire for, the craving for, and the celebration of the sexual union between a man and a woman. And here's something that you need to know. If you were to ask people in society, or even just look at the last couple of verses that we read from Proverbs, who has the the bigger sex drive? Most everybody would say, oh, it's the man, it's the man. The one book of the Bible that describes and talks about in great detail about erotic love is not a man-driven book. It is a female-driven book. According to English Standard, they assigned one verse for the title, 
Six and a half verses for the chorus. They might be called the others, but they're, they're the chorus. Just think about your English classes or your, your literature classes when you did the Greek tragedy. They're the chorus. 38 verses are given to the man. And a whopping 72 and a half verses are given to the woman. That book is all about what she wants, and she wants her man. And I know sometimes if you look at progressive liberal literature about the Apostle Paul, they put him down as someone who subjugates women. Well, I'll tell you what he does in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He doesn't subjugate women. He brings women up sexually to the same level as men. Because he says to the man, man, you don't own your body. It is hers. And it's not all about what you want. It's also about what she wants. And I want to take a familiar passage and kind of wrap this point up on this. The Hebrew writer says, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, he says, don't let the marriage bed be defiled. Don't let it be a place of corruption. The marriage bed and the place where the married couple comes together to enjoy their sexual oneness that God said is good should be a place that is protected. It should be a place that is free of shame. It should be a place where there can be delight and freedom and love in one another. Ladies, don't, don't deprive your man. And men, don't make it all about you. This is a place where God said we come together as one. This is a place where we enjoy a relationship that is like no other relationship. We can be together in all of our vulnerabilities and know that we are loved and accepted and honored and can be embraced. The world is crazy over sex. There might be a temptation for us to retreat from the marketplace of ideas and discussions. We cannot do that. We have to speak. We have to model for the world what, what a God-honoring marriage looks like. That we love our spouse as ourselves. That we place them primarily above all others. And that we solidify that bond of marriage with this good, God-honoring, sexual relationship that God has given us. That binds us together. The world needs to see it in us. And we need to show it for, to them. I would just, just, I would just end on this. There are people in this congregation that might need a little help. Don't turn into yourself. Don't consult the psych pop of society. You're blessed with elders. You're blessed with godly ministers. Go to them. Go to their wives. And seek the help that you need in your marriage to make it strong. And if we do that, 
Not only will we have better families, we'll have better churches. And if we have better and stronger churches, we'll have better communities where we can show the gospel message. Thank you very much for listening. Just a couple of closing announcements, <clears throat> and then uh, Brother Jason's going to lead us in a dismissal prayer. First, Clay, thank you. Appreciate um, your handling of, a, of this subject and, and the, uh, the thoughts that you presented tonight. It, it's, a, it's a fantastic lesson, um, one that we'll keep in the archives for sure. Paul says in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, in verse 33, he says, let each one of you, in, in talking to the husbands, love your wife as himself, and let each of the wife see that she respects her husband. So, Clay, thank you for, uh, for bringing that, those thoughts to us tonight. Um, thank you again, both Kay, Clay and Shelley, for coming up and spending part of your vacation time with us. And, and uh, we're grateful that you could be with us and look forward to your return someday uh, if you happen to be back in this particular area. Thank you to our visitors that are with us. We appreciate that. We're grateful that you all could always be with us. And we always look forward to uh, your return as well. Come back anytime and, um, and, and visit with us and let us uh, get to know you and stand by for a couple of moments while we get to say hello. Um, let us also remember um, our um, services on Sunday. Uh, we'll be back together on Sunday at our normal time. Um, let us also continue to remember next Tuesday as we come back together for our, our summer series. And, and as Clay mentioned, and my uh, final thought, Please, if there's anything that Russ or George or I can do to help you in your spiritual walk, um, please don't let this opportunity in tonight uh, slip away. If there's something that we could do, uh, we're here for you and we'll be glad to pray with you. If there's any assistance that you might need in your marriage, uh, certainly we're there to help you as well. Um, but uh, whatever that need might be, uh, please let us know tonight uh, before you leave the building. So with that, Brother Jason, if you don't mind, please uh, lead us in our dismissal prayer. Our Holy Father in heaven, we give you thanks that tonight we've been able to open your word and to expound on difficult and challenging topic. We pray, dear Lord, that you would give us boldness, that we will never shy away from the things that society has made difficult for us as Christians to talk about. But we pray that we might grow through this summer series and the topics that have been selected. We might internally challenge ourselves so that we can learn to live in this world in a way which will shed your light and bring others to you. Lord, we're thankful for Brother Gentry, his artful way of sharing your word tonight and challenging us. And we pray, Lord, that we will accept those challenges in your ways more truly. Father, we pray for your help tonight, for that which Satan has perverted, we pray. You will help us to be making pure that which Satan has distracted us from, that we can be redirected. And help us, dear Lord, make our marriages what they need to be so that the world can see you through our love for each other. Lord, we know there are people that are hurting tonight. 
There are people who have families that they're concerned about, like our sister Barbara, people who are traveling, people who have pain that we don't know, people who've lost their loved ones, people who are struggling with their health, struggling with decisions. Help them to look to you, our ultimate guide through this world. Dear Lord, we give you praise as much as we give you thanks because you are a loving Father and a good Father and one who's given us another day on this earth. So we pray that you help us to fulfill our purpose as your children. These things we ask through Jesus' name and amen.